your mercy and grace, we give you praise, we give you honor, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Can, can I have my iPad, please? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, praise the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Okay. Last week, last month, we dealt with uh, Brother Moses, tried to figure out how we were so angry like what was going on with him. And then we discovered where anger came from. It came from down line. It came from before he was born. It came from how he was born. It came from what he went through. And then the man was really, really angry. You know, so for him it was anger. For you and me, it can be something else. Um, this month, I want to deal with, again, I've dealt with this before, we've done this before, but I think it's important that as we go towards the end of the year, we revisit this uh, topic of outers, A-L-T-A-R-S, outers. Uh, we've taught the doorways to stuff in our lives. There are three doorways. Number one is sin. Number two is outers in our lives. So, sin or disobedience Sin or disobedience is one thing. It's the same thing. Sin or disobedience is one thing. When I sin, something comes in my life. So sin and disobedience is, is a doorway. Also, outers, A-L-T-A-R-S, and I'm going to explain what that is really. Then, then ignorance. There is a doorway called ignorance. We just, I just don't know. And then things start coming in your life, but it's because you don't know how to close the doors. Some of it is uh, by choice. Some of it is access to the knowledge. I don't have access to the knowledge. Now, when I say ignorance, I don't mean you don't know anything, anything. Okay. Okay. I fly, I fly a plane. I can fly a plane. Anyone volunteer here who wants to fly with me? Probably not. Any volunteers that want to fly with me, like, oh, yeah, 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 take me somewhere? No, why? Because you don't trust me as a pilot. You may trust me as a tea pastor, like, well, you know what? If I need the word of God, I'll call him. But if I need to fly to D.C., probably... I would rather pay $500 and fly with him. Don't say that. <laughs> yeah. So when, you say, when I say ignorance, I don't mean total, total ignorance. It's insufficient knowledge of that subject. Insufficient knowledge of who Jesus is and of what Jesus has done in your life. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. So, um, what is an outer? So, I mean, we, we, we won't deal with ignorance or, or sin as much as important that is. 
So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. An altar is a platform. Spiritual, it can be spiritual, it can be personal, it can be an organization. Altars is the way that God deals with man. God responds to man through an altar. But also, the devil will contact man through an altar. First, like, look. I'm a, I'm a product of a wedlock. My parents were not married when they had me. I'm a product of that. Jesus redeemed me. Jesus fixed things up. My father, you know, my father was 21 when he had me. When I turned 21, I got a girl pregnant. Why? An altar. An altar was established at that age. Spiritually. Why do we struggle, especially with sexual sin? Because somewhere, somehow, down the line, there can be an outer, and that outer has a voice. How do I know an outer has a voice? You know, and I'm just going everywhere here. I haven't even started yet. Look at Genesis 8, verse 20 and 21. Genesis 8, verse 20 and 21. To show you that an outer has a voice. Verse 20, the Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took off every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. What did he do? He built an altar and he offered burnt offering on that altar. Next verse, verse 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor or sweet aroma and the Lord said in his heart so there was the voice from God as a result of erecting an altar God spoke through that and listen, listen to what he said that speaking was not just for that day that speaking was for generations to come. So he is God and he says, I will not again, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. Which means, what you've done Noah, you've not just done it for your, for your sons and your, your children. You've done it for generations to come. I will not do this because of what you've done. So God spoke. Why? Because of what was done on the altar. Oh. Anybody getting what I'm saying here? So you, let's say you have, you have America, United States of America. Despite what your views are on America, despite all the crazy things that was done after, but the forefathers, the first one of the first people that came, they built an altar and they said, Jehovah, you are God. Jehovah, this land belongs to you. Now, later on, slavery came, mistakes were done and all this, but the initial, the initial establishment of this country, people sat down and held hands and said, we offer this country to America, I mean to Jesus. We build an altar for this nation. You wonder why America is blessed. Now listen, I've been around the world. I've been around the world.
You can say China. You can say Japan. You can say Singapore. You can mention any country. Even England. All nations look to America. Why? Because of the covenant. Because of the altar that they erected. They sat down. So when mom and daddy sit down and say, Lord, we build an altar unto you that our children will not suffer. They may have made that altar hundred years ago, but that altar can still speak. God spoke through. God spoke. Why? Because there's an altar. And this voice, this word has not stopped. It's still coming. That's why whenever there's a flood, whenever there were some floods in New Orleans, and some preachers got on TV and says God is judging America. No. He said you'll never do it that way. So I would rather believe him than believe some preacher that is making up stories. That's why we have to be, we have to understand the word of God before we utter every, anything. He said he will never do it. So guess what? I'll believe him. Then believe some preacher. Believe some TV evangelist that comes out and says, Oh, America, repent. God is judging you through this. No, 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 no. No, 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 sir. I'm not saying God cannot judge us, but he's not judging us through that. There can be other judgment, but not that. That he said you'll never do it. Okay? So now, Um, results in an individual, in a church, in a company, in a nation, in a zip code, what goes on there is more spiritual than you see. It's more, the, the underlying reason in why, why whatever is happening in that individual's life or in that family's life is as a result of altars that is built. Look, in Maryland there was this guy. He was not spiritual. He was crazy. But every prophet that came around town, they would pick him up. Hey, and Look, now, we were that we are spiritual. We were that we thought we were spiritual. I'm thinking, what's up with him? And the prophet will always say, God, I see this. Different prophets will call him out. I'm thinking, what's up with that guy? First of all, he never showed up for prayer. He never showed up for anything. He was as carnal as it can be. Until one day, I don't know, we're talking. No, we were at his house. Then, you know, there was um, a photo album on the table. I said, oh, can I see that here? So the great grandmother. Pictures of them, crusades. Grandma, praying. So, so you see a generation of people that were prayerful. And I said, okay. Why? The altars that those people made. They are speaking for him. Ah, uh, this woman helped Build, O R I U. I mean, the, the, the grandpa helped build O R I U. He traveled, volunteered his hours to go and build O R I U. Listen, you think God is blind? God sees that. And He makes a covenant with that man that your kids, I will be their God, they will be mine. Now, I'm not saying you can live anywhere you want, but I'm saying 
Why are some people just, they just try something. They try selling salt and they make it. You are trying to sell stuff with your website, with everything. And you are not, you are not breaking through. Somebody else comes around and they set a table across the street. And they are selling rubbish. And that stuff goes. Why? The altars that speak. Those are things that you have to deal with. Um, let me deal with the godly altars. Godly altars. Hebrews 4, verse 14. When, you, when we get born again, you don't get born again because of a location. You can get born again anywhere. You can hear a message from YouTube of a preacher that died 100 years ago and still receive. It doesn't matter that guy is dead. The message is not dead. So a person can get born again. Why? Because the, the, the message of salvation does not change regardless of who says it. There is an altar that was created where at the cross when Jesus died at the cross, when Jesus said, if you, if you are born again, when Jesus spoke those words about being born again, those words, no matter where they're spoken, they still stand. Now look at this. Seeing then that we have great high priest that passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our Profession. Next verse. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Verse 16. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That throne of grace is what I refer to as an altar of grace. Anyone that comes to that will obtain mercy and will find grace and will be helped. Anyone, regardless whether a Muslim, whether uh, a drunkard, when I got born again, I was drunk. I've told you my testimony. But regardless of my condition, because I came to this altar called the throne of grace, I was able to receive salvation. You know, David and I, we were, we were in uh, Knoxville. A woman came drunk, smelling drunk. And when God healed her, even the smell left her. Why? It's an outer. I hope I am making sense. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All satanic altars are powered by an altar called sin and iniquity. Just like godly altars, you know, um, Sean and Tommy, probably four years ago, four or five years ago, they 
we sat, I don't know if it were here or Bill Town. And uh, they gave an offering for their daughter. And I remember this, I don't know if you remember. That this is for my baby girl. We sat and prayed. And we made declaration that that, they, they, in the, that was for Madison, I believe. That she will have, she will have a bigger house. She will be greater. Madison? Sean was telling me, she has a bigger house than our house. She's 21, 21. She is married. Oh, that girl is so mature. Well, what's the difference? That, that they erected. They came and we erected an altar unto the Lord. And that altar, regardless of where Madison goes, will speak for her. That's how these things work. They will forever, forever speak for you. But you have to establish something for that to happen. You can't just be like that. There are certain things that has to be demolished. Outers that has been erected by you, that has to be demolished. Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Judges 6, verse 1. You know, the goodness of God is uh, not fully understood. If we are thinking about a good parent, we don't think about a spanking parent as a good parent. A parent that spanks us is a good parent. So when we think about God, because I've heard people say, if God, how can a good God send people to hell? How can a good God punish people? It's not that he just wants to punish you and me. He punishes people as a result of our own disobedience. If yes, actions. If I tell you as my child, don't run outside, it's, it's 20 degrees, put your jacket on, and you, by your own making, you don't feel like putting your jacket on. You just feel like running outside without a jacket, without shoes. Then you get sick. Who is to blame? Yeah, sure. You blame the parent. But really, who is to blame? You have a jacket. I bought you a jacket. I bought you boots. I bought you gloves. I bought you everything. All you have to do is to go in your room and wear those things, and then you can go outside. But you decide not to. Then you get sick. Then guess who runs around? The parent. Take it to the hospital. Was it the parent is fault that you are sick? No. It was your fault. It was my fault that I got sick. Why? Because I disobeyed the law. There is a law that governs the temperature. Me, by going outside, the body would tell me that, uh, go back inside and put on your jacket. But if I ignore that, then I'll get sick. Then if I get sick, so if I'm Tammy's child, I get sick out of my disobedience, but still her job to take care of me. But I'll suffer now look at this. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. 
Who did evil? The children. What happened after doing evil? And the Lord delivered them unto the hand of Midianite seven years. Suffering. For seven years, they were delivered. But in that seven years, they had the chance to repent. Because the same Bible says, if you confess, that seven years can be two days. That seven years can be one day. But most of the time, we hang on. Let's go to verse 2. And the hand of Midianites prevailed against Israel. And because of Midianites, the children of Israel made them the Danes which are in the mountain and caves and strongholds. They suffered as a result of sin. Now, you may be not one of those here. You may say, well, I don't sin. I'm good. John, 1 John 1 verse 10. 1 John chapter 1 verse 10. In fact, let's just start from verse 9. No, let's start from verse 8. Then we'll go to verse 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You hear that? We deceive ourselves. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10. If we say that we have, no, we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Which means all men have sinned. Okay, the key is not to live in sin. There's a difference. You've sinned and living in sin. So living in sin is, is a decision that somebody makes and says, I don't care about this. I'm going to live that way. That's, that's a decision that one makes. Sinning is simply things that goes on in your head. You know, you look at somebody, you judge them, you, you know, you look at somebody, you, you, you are enticed in your heart, things like that. So, there is sinning and then there is living in sin. As far as sinning is concerned, everybody does it. Okay? But living in sin, that is what I'm talking about here. You decide not to live that way. Whatever that way is, the day you, you realize that this is sin, you start getting away from it. So that is an indiv individual sin. Then there's what I refer to as territorial sin. Territorial sin. Territory. There are two territorial sins in the Bible that I see. One was destroyed because they repented not. The other one was spared because people repented. Territory. Genesis 18, verse 20. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done, whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned, verse 22, and the men turned their faces from thence and went down to Sodom. And, but Abram stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near. We know the story that Sodom and Gomorrah was bent. Why? Because of territory. They are territories that can be sinful. Not individual. So a group of individuals. Why are some countries 
they say, country called Haiti, where witchcraft is a national uh, religion, where government leaders will go to a certain place to go and worship the idol. They have given the country to the devil. I had, we had a friend there. He died. He disappeared. Probably they killed him. He cursed the tree that they worship. They worship and the tree dried. So they begged him to revive the tree. So, okay, that country that have offered themselves to the devil you see calamities that happen again and again, again and again. Now, it's not God judging them. It's the altars that they have opened. It's the devil destroying them. They've come away from the, from the, from the covering of God and they've opened themselves to the enemy. Poverty, earthquakes. The country's poor already, but there have been several earthquakes in that nation. Why? The country was given to the enemy. Now, a lot of countries, most of countries in Africa, that out of fear, people gathered and they prayed to the demonic entities and those demonic entities became their God. Territory. Let's go to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. Jonah 1 verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For the wickedness is come before me. Which means... The wickedness of the city, not of a person. So collectively, people there, they have sinned, but the judgment is not against an individual. The judgment is against a city. So no matter how much they do, the economy will not work. They can go good people, but... Because they have created an altar of sin. And that will keep pushing back. Is, is, is it making sense? Verse 3, But Jonah rose up and flew into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid a fee and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Here is the man that disobeyed God. And the result of disobeying God is going down. It doesn't matter what you do, you go down. That's what it says, that he went down. He paid a fee and went down. But Jonah was like, look, I don't like these people anyway. And I know you, you will forgive them. But let's go to verse 3. Um, chapter 3 of, of uh, Jonah chapter 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city. Preach unto them the preaching that I bid thee. Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And Nineveh was the exceeding great city of three days' journey. Verse 4, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Nay, yet 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. So which means, this prophet saw even the timing of the Lord that it would take for him to overthrow the city. So he says to them, if you don't repent, this city will be overthrown. 40 days. Next verse. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast, put a sacrifice from greatest to them, even to the least of them. Verse 6. 
For the word came unto the king, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered himself with the and, and in, sat in ashes. Next verse. Cause it to be proclaimed, published through Nineveh, by the decree of a king. Is nobody saying, let neither man nor beast nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. Now, this was a fast that dogs and cats also fasted. You know why? Because if, if, if you obtain something through sin, you steal money, and I, I steal money and I buy food. The people that eat the food, they become partakers according to this. So sin was so great such that even the animals had to fast to purge themselves from that. Why? Because they would have been destroyed through what? Through the altar of sin. Are we following? Territory. So God preserved this territory. Why? Because people cried out for mercy. He is the one that I really want to deal with. Foundations and bloodlines. Altars that are powered by foundations and bloodline. This, we can ignore this, but it's there. We can do whatever it takes. But if this is not dealt with, it will be there. Look at Psalm 11, verse 3. Because that verse, I've read it and I'm thinking, oh God, why? Look at that. Psalm 11, verse 3. If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Not what can the unrighteous do. What can the righteous do? Meaning, if the foundation is broken, you can be as righteous as you want to be. You can be as holy as you want to be. It will not work for you until the foundation is fixed. Because the foundation be broken, what can the righteous do? Meaning, unless you deal with the foundations, you have, you, your efforts will be meaningless. And how many people, how many great people, they mean well. They try. They are sincere. But things do come against them. Why? Have I taken time have I taken time to deal with foundation? Have I taken time to deal with these things? Foundation. How I grew up. What I saw. What I was exposed to. What are the things in my life that has built a foundation to where I am today? What did I see? And now, I'm trying to live my life up here and not deal with the foundation. Look at Jeremiah 1. Let's go to verse 10. Jeremiah 1, verse 10. Jeremiah 1. Okay, so the prophet does say, See, I have this day set thee over the nations, over the kingdoms. Okay. I've promoted you to that. 
you are promoted to this position. I have made you a king and a priest. You are a prophet. You are a pastor. You are an evangelist. You are a teacher. You are a manager. You are a husband. You are all this. But if you don't deal with the foundation, if you don't root out foundations, if you don't pull down foundations, if you don't destroy foundations, if you don't throw down foundations, it will be difficult for you to build and plant. It will be difficult for you to go forward. Why? Because these foundations that, that uh, Psalm 11 discusses will come to you and bring you down. Why do you think? You know, uh, maybe 18 years ago, 18 years ago, there was a, a man, a man of God, huge, huge church, huge church, who were praying one day, John. We were in Maryland. This guy was in uh, Colorado. And a prophetic word came that call this man and pray for him. We did not know what. That woman even got his phone number in prayer. So right there they called. And we introduced ourselves as deliverance. We are a deliverance group out of Maryland. We just got to pray with you. And the man said, oh, I don't need prayers. I'm good. You, you deliverance people, you see, you see the devil more than you see Jesus. You know. Not too long after that, the man fell. And the accusation was that, no, the truth was, he slept with boys in the church. Fast forward, he was on Larry King on CNN, interviewing him. And he said these words. He said, when I'm preaching, there was a desire in my heart to sleep with men. Married, big church, good family. And I, I saw that. I said, hold on. Then I called somebody. Said, hey, who's that guy that we prayed for whatever time? They didn't remember until somebody remembered. He's on CNN. And then he explained how he grew up. How these altars are formed. Listen. Time does not deal with altars. I want you to understand that. Time does not deal with altars. The fact that it's been away. Okay, look. How old is America? How old is America? Somebody. Huh? Over 200 years. 250 years. Okay. Let's say 250 years. The people that came, they sat down and prayed. 250 years ago. That thing that they did is still speaking today. 250 years. Genesis 8, 20 to 21. When was that? Years, 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 years ago. But though it was spoken many years ago, we can benefit from it today. Amen? Which means... Time does not deal with outers. When it comes to breaking outers, they, you deal with them, you have to break them, not ignore them. So I look at that man and thinking, oh God. But when he explained his life, then you understand 
that the altars that were formed in his life that were not dealt with. I'm not excluding myself to things like this. Altars are things that need to be dealt with because it hinders. Look at Hosea chapter 7, verse 1. It hinders the activities or the involvement of God in our lives. Hosea 7 verse 1. Thank you. When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered. Listen, I am trying to heal a situation and then something else comes around. Yes, you are repenting to me, you are giving to me, you are doing all this, but deal with this first. Then I'll come through. It's like being married. You cannot be married until you, if you are divorced, if you are not divorced, you cannot tell the judge that, well, she's about to sign the papers. No. You're still married then. Or I, I have sent the divorce papers, so she will sign, and then I know for sure she will sign, so just allow me to marry. No. You, that has to be dealt with. When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered and the wickedness of Samaria. For they commit falsehood and the thief comes in and the troop of robbers falls without. Verse 2. They consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So what one man did, I want you to see something else. And death passed upon all men that have not sinned. Wait a minute. So, one action of one man, an action of a father in a home can cause the whole family to go down. Action of one man. One man. That's what he's saying there. By one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for all that have sinned. So, the action of one man the action of a person in a... Look, it takes one man to mess up in a football for the whole team to lose. One man. Just one man. The whole 11 can be good players, but just one man. One man can mess up the whole team by one man. Next verse, verse 13. For until the law sin, until the law sin was not in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Verse 19. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, verse uh, yeah. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned. After the spirit of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come? So now. One man empowered the whole thing, the whole earth. But also, one man came and redeemed us through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are redeemed. But we cannot ignore this here. Okay, let me deal with some other things here. What are the common things that I have observed? Me personally. Mysterious diseases, infirmities or sickness. There are some diseases that are in families. Mama had it. Grandpa had it. And now it's down. 
Here is one thing. Altars by association. If a person carries certain altars, sometimes those altars will follow. You remember Jonah? Jonah was only in a boat. He paid for a flight. For a, you know. And chaos came on that boat. They were about to die. Why? One man was in there. Is it possible that one man can be on the plane and the plane can crash? Yes. One man. That's why you pray. You pray. And you make declaration. I will not be a partaker of anybody's sin. In the name of Jesus. So they had to throw Jonah out of the boat. Because they asked around that, hey, what's going on here? So is it possible that one man... Now, I'm not saying you throw your friends out. No. That's why there's repentance. So don't like, oh, I'm going to throw you out. Like, you, ever since, ever since I've known you, you know, I've had trouble. Oh, God, man, I'm going to throw you out. No. That's why the blood of Jesus. I cannot emphasize on sexual perversion. How you are born. I prayed for my good friend. I shouldn't mention the city. Anyway, they were, their daughter was their worship leader. Their daughter is, she's 26 now, she was 24, she was the worship leader. They, Christmas of 2021, Christmas, New Year, going to New Year, New Year's Eve, I don't know, Christmas Eve, she woke up and said to her parents, before they went to the uh, New Year's Eve service, she said, Mom, Dad, can I talk to you? Say, yes. Why aren't you singing? You know, I want to tell you something. And then she said, she said, I believe I don't want to be a girl anymore. That's what she said. Why? Now, you are a worship leader. Like, what's going on? Oh, I've felt like this for a long time. Okay. Honey, this is a picture of you with Pastor Benny Hinn prophesying. This is a picture of you with Mary and Hickey. This is, people have prophesied over you. Like, what's happening? I don't know. I call, they, you know, they called me after midnight. We prayed and prayed and prayed. When I was praying, I saw in, in, in my imagination, I thought it was an imagination, I saw a blue baby room. Then I asked the question, I said, I don't know why, but did you decide to have a boy? Yes. So before you had her, you desired a boy. Yes. And you, you made the room you prepared a room for a boy, yes. So were you disappointed when you had her as a girl? The mother bursted into cry. Say yes. Say that time, a spirit of rejection entered the child. 
And that is what the struggle has to do. But if you repent and you reverse that desire, you will see change. They repented, they asked for forgiveness, and they called and they asked for forgiveness from God. She left, but she came back two days after. And now, she's a worship leader again. And now, she's married. With a, with a, no, she's pregnant. What am I saying? The things that are established and the outers that speak I, I pray that this is making sense. Here is something that I stagnation and delays. It's common. Your parents went through it and you are going through it yourself. Here's an addition to that. Near success. Almost there. I almost made it. I almost got married. I almost, like every time your story is, I almost made it. What's going on? That's the story of your mom and daddy. That's the story of your grandpa. Now that is your story. If these things are continuing, then there's something spiritual that has to be dealt with. Amen? What do we do? Real quick, what do we do? Uh, let me deal with this also. Witchcraft and idol worship. This includes gangs. Gang affiliation. In Africa, it can be witchcraft. Here, it's gang. Because gangs, sometimes they even go deeper where they even share blood. I don't know, what, what's that movie? Cal uh, Courageous. If anybody has seen Courageous. So to join a gang, they beat you up. And then they tell you, beat you up because we love you. Yeah, this boy goes in and they beat him up, they blood him, they kick him, they boom. and then the boss comes, okay, 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 no, stop, no, get up. Does that mean I'm in? Yes. Initiation was being stomped on. You bleed. And then you affiliate to that group based on how they welcomed you. And what is that? It's the same thing as witchcraft. So you find yourself in, in stuff like that. Or incarceration. Your daddy was in jail. Your grandpa was in prison. You come along. You try to be as good as you can be. Why? Because those altars are speaking against you. It becomes very difficult for you to stay away from that. You just find yourself in trouble. You know, there are certain things. I was talking to a friend of mine. He said uh, he prayed for this guy. And... Uh, He's never had a ticket for 17 years. He prayed for this guy. In one week, he had two tickets. One week. One, he parked on, he didn't pay attention, he was coming, then he parked on a um, handicap thing. You know, there they, they are those signs that are just on the ground. There's no, nothing posted. He just came and he parked there. 
He comes back, there's a 250 ticket on his thing. So he's like, oh, then he's, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I did not see this. The other one, in Maryland, if you look at your, if you hold a cell phone, it's a ticket. He's driving down, he's driving, so he's trying to confirm the, the, the exit number. He's like, he picked up his phone and then put it down. He got put off and the ticket. So he, started, he went back to thinking, at what in the world was that? And the Lord gave, showed him, the guy you prayed for has several tickets. He prayed, repented, broke that. Guess what? Even that ticket that he got on the, on the handcuff sign, because they realized that the, the sign was covered by snow, so they gave him a break. They didn't charge him. The other ticket, he was dismissed. But what I'm saying is there are just certain things that we see as, oh, it's nothing. It's just a ticket. No. Look at it from the spiritual perspective and deal with it. Amen? Fixing this. How do we fix this? Verse King 18. Verse 30. Verse King 18, verse 30. And Elijah said unto the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And what did he do? He repaired the altars. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Well, when, when was it broken down? It was broken down by my own action. Whatever I have done, somehow... That outer is broken. It's broken. It had to be repaired. Hold on. These are people that are supposed to come for the service. They are lost. Hello? Yes. Hello? Are you, you coming for the class? Okay, I'm in a class, so let me call you back. I'm sorry. I, I, I thought you were. Okay. Elijah, verse 31. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribe of the sons of Jacob, and to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. So there is something that I have to do. I have to see what outers that need to be fixed in my own life. Okay. How have I dealt with my finances? Is the area of my finances, are outers in that area need to be fixed? What about my sexuality, my sexual life? Have I been sleeping around though I'm married? I need to fix that. What about just my love life, my, the way I treat people? Have I been treating people right? So, I do a diagnosis of my life. Now, one day, I was uh, back home, and I got up to go get some water. Then I found my mother on the floor, crying and repenting. And, uh, you know, I heard somebody talk, then I stopped. Then I heard her say this, Lord, my child, my children, she was basically pray praying for my sister. She will never get pregnant at 21 like I did. That spirit, whatever it is, I repent of it in the name of Jesus. She will never get pregnant at the age of 21. She will never get pregnant out of wedlock 
And you know, I just listened in like, wow. I didn't want to hear anymore. I went back. I didn't even go to get my water. I just went back and I'm thinking. So I started thinking. Wow. So there are things that we take for granted. Like I said, time does not deal with that. What deals with those things is the blood of Jesus. Is repentance. Amen? So repairing. Repair the altar of the Lord. That was broken down. Then there's 31. It took 12 stones. That's how those things was repaired. Last verse. 2 Chronicles 33 verse 15. 2 Chronicles 33 verse 15. And he took away the strange gods. That's another thing. Take away strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord. Now, when you talk about this, people will say, oh, I don't have any strange gods in my life. I don't have any strange, I don't have any idols. Guess what? You do. I can point them out to you. The idols today are not monumentals. The idols today are in our hearts, in our minds. What is that thing that you've trusted to be God? Is it your job? Is it your intellect? That thing that somehow you've trusted to be God is what here is being referred to be an idol. I've taught this before. Pain can be an idol. A situation can be an idol. People worship a situation. People connect themselves to the pain they have and they take that as a badge of honor. Be, be, uh, feeling sorry for yourself, that itself can be an idol. They took that out of the house of the Lord and the altars that he had built in the mountain of the house of the Lord and Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. He took them out. What is that idol in your life, in my life, that we need to deal with? Hallelujah.